Standing by, the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval, where you are part of the family. So make your bed and clean up your room. And maybe you can take the F base out for a spin. I am, um, I'm very excited about this. Uh, Ted, are you? I am very much so, yes. It says right there, standing by. Yeah, the, look at uh, that, eh? Story of Terry and Ted, episode one. Before we get started, Ted. Yes. How are you? I'm good. How good. are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Sitting across from each other in, yeah. uh, for the first time in how many years? Well, I guess it's 14 years because I think we did our last show in November of 2007. So wow. almost 14 years. Wow. I think that's when, uh, I think it was 2007 wow. when you left for Calgary. I, was, uh, I wasn't I was sure about this and I want to start by saying thank you to the people who were very excited about this, and that includes uh, the wonderful family at the folks in Laval. Jaguar Land Rover Laval, the DiCabellos family. And also to uh, Anthony and Norma and Val and Jackie and everybody at Matla Bonheur, longtime supporters of mine and now a supporter of the podcast. And last but not least, our great and good friends at Mercen Automotive. Uh, Kara and uh, Celso, uh, both of us have been yeah. speaking on their behalf yeah. uh, for low these many years. Uh, you, uh, well, both of us on the air for quite a while at Shom, and then subsequently uh, I became their very uh, handsome social media guy. <laughs> yeah, and we were we were particularly. I'm just going to take these off. We were, we were particularly um, uh, encouraged, I guess I should say, by their uh, their enthusiasm for for us taking on a podcast. Yeah, and it was also, nice. Um, and, and we won't bore you with thank yous the whole way through, but also we we got to th- thank Pentelis and the gang here. Oh, boy. Because they were they were the first ones, weren't they? The, Pentelis, Mike Ward. Yep. When we uh, when it, when your quote-unquote retirement from Shome was announced, right. uh, Pentelis and Mike Ward uh, both said, uh, Terry and Ted have to do a podcast. Yep. And they have this studio among, this is just a small part of the Pentelis podcast empire yeah. pantelis is a montreal comedian who got into the podcast game on the ground floor and he now works uh, out of a studio uh up in uh, the north end are we are we in park x uh, or mile end i think we're in in, in uh, poseidon's gonna tell us none yeah. of the above none none of, of no where above. are we <laughs> <laughs> we're a little north <laughs> oh, okay uh poseidon is is uh producing the show for us today and uh, he's part of the Pantelis uh, podcast team, and it's it's the funniest thing to me. Poseidon is is and and he might you know say, oh no, I'm not. He's a podcast star. Yes, all of these guys is. are. Him and Mike and Pantelis yeah. do a podcast called Two Drink Minimum, which for my money is the funniest podcast out there, the funniest one I've heard anyway. And I, I was excited by uh, their excitement today when they said. Their grandfathers were big fans. <laughs> <laughs> that was Phil. What what does Phil do here, Poseidon? What's Phil's role here? He's one of the partners. He's the Mr. Director. He's the Mr. Director. And Phil was saying, yeah, my grandfather used to listen to you guys on the radio. Thanks. Poseidon has no idea who we are. Right. Yeah. And, and, and because he has no idea who we are, I guess we shouldn't make an adventure joke, right? What do you mean? Poseidon Adventure? No, no, probably no, no. not. Okay. No, All no. Right. But uh, Poseidon is, uh, like I say, the guy's a legitimate. Uh, yes. He's, he's a legitimate podcast star. And we're thrilled to have him yeah. here. Yeah. And, uh, and he, know, he knows what he's doing. So yeah. he's going to help guide us. Uh, he's going to help guide us through I, um, this. To give you an idea of how nervous I am, I've got a schwitz on. Uh, you can see the top of my forehead. I'm working uh, without a fan. And they've shut the air conditioning off, but I... Oh, that's not going to be good. I don't know why I'm nervous. Are you nervous? You're not uh, nervous? No, not so bad. No. But you were always... You, you always... Um, like, the heat always came out of the top yes. of your head. Yeah, always looked like... Um, and this was especially fun at big events we were hosting. It yeah. always looked like I'd been swimming <laughs> shortly, <laughs> shortly before we went on stage. So that was always really nice. Just go for a dip, did you, Terry? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Added a few laps. <laughs> So we, we thought uh, what we do to launch the podcast, it w- we would talk about what I think, and uh, this is blowing smoke up our own arse, um, I thought we would talk about uh, the beginnings of our friendship mm-hmm. and our professional relationship that, um, again, blowing smoke up our own arse, proved to be uh, fairly successful, I think, in the, in the radio business 
uh, through the 80s, 90s, and into the aughts. I think it did too. And uh, to me, what uh, the most gratifying part to me is that the friendship has endured. Yes. And, uh, and as a result of that, we're sitting here today, yeah. uh, low these many years uh, after we... Um, after our professional working relationship right. ended. So hopefully this will be the start of, uh, of something yeah. new. Yeah, I hope so, because uh, as I pointed out to you in the car today, um, one of the things that I, uh, I don't miss getting up in the middle of the night, and I don't miss uh, the machinations of what the business has become, yeah. but I do miss telling stories. I miss the microphone and I miss telling stories. And the idea that you and I could sit across from each other is so exciting because... As we headed towards my retirement at Shome, I uh, the morning that that uh, you were on with me, it was like it it, it came right back, and yeah. I it it kind of uh, it primed the pump again because years ago I they took away my my last partner years ago when they let Heather Backman go. Mm-hmm. I'd been working alone for quite some time and um, much prefer to work with with people, and of course. Uh, working with you was, you know, with full respect to other people that we worked with, you know, including Patty and Heather and Cindy Aikman and and the the great parade of people we had with us. Um, there there was something special about when you and I got going. Well, and it's the same with me. I've had many great uh, on air partners uh, before and after I worked with you. Uh, Mark Burns, Bruce Kenyon, Jeff Lumby, uh, Java Jacobs at K103 in Ganawage, uh, Tom Whalen now at, uh, where do I work now? A light light 106.7. 106. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and great on and off air relationships, one and all. But yeah, there is there, there always has been something special. And I'm singing about it the other day, trying to identify what is it exactly. And I think some of it's innate. But I also think a lot of it has to do with, I think we were raised similarly. similarly. Yeah, uh, We're the same age. We, I think we were raised uh, uh, with similar values. Yes, I, I think we were raised by people who had similar tastes in yeah. popular culture. Yeah. So everything has always been relatable. That will be where there's an edit. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should leave it in. <laughs> are these in, are these that unidirectional? Are they? Sorry, are these that unidirectional? No, just, in other words, you got to talk right into them. Yeah, because if you lean back a bit, right, you you hear it. It sounds further. Well, that's no good. I'm leaving. How's this? How's this? Is this good, Prentella? Uh, sorry, Poseidon. How's my mic technique? Yeah. Overmodulating. <laughs> what do you mean, overmodulating? That's an inside radio game. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, man. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think I think there was a similarity uh, to the way we were raised, and also our our values. And you know, it's hard to imagine now, but we came up at a time where we said things and did things that today we would be fired for, and we weren't controversial. No, no, not at right. all. Uh, but you can get fired for a lot these days, yeah. too. I find you got to tiptoe yeah. more these days yes. than, uh, than ever. Let's, let's talk about, because it was real happenstance. I, I, I want to talk about when, when we first got started. I had already arrived at Shom. I was... Like I'd love to see. You were a big deal. There was well, no, there was no fucking uh, being no, around no, this guy no, no, at no. all. He was just. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had just arrived. At, Don't you know who I think I am? <laughs> I had just got I'm to kidding. show him in 1984, and I, I have to admit, I was shitting kittens because I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to do a morning show. I had no idea to how to be a morning guy, and Patty Peppermint Patty really, really was such a massive help to me through that period listen that was a good timing because yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't have been any help to you the way that pat no seriously she was she was the perfect yeah on-air partner yeah. uh, partner for you at that time yeah. and also a friend off the air yeah. as well and, like and, i wouldn't have held your hand through that yeah. i would have been like hey, you're on your own pal i got my own problems <laughs> and and uh that friendship endures to this day yeah. i should mention but it started with we were actually working as uh, competitors 
You, yes, I was you, at I FM was at and I was at FM ninety six, which became Mix ninety six, which uh, is now Virgin. But I don't think that's going to last much longer. I don't know what they're going to do with it next. Mm-hmm. If they're going to turn it into, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, I was at Scaramouche one night, which was a bar on. It was on Bishop, wasn't it? Patty was a bartender there. Oh, okay. On Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Can you imagine? Yeah, and some. I, I don't remember exactly how it transpired, but I think someone said to me, Terry Demonte wants to buy you a drink, and I knew who you were. I knew you were the morning man at show, but we had never met so you bought me a drink and it was probably something really fruity because it was the <laughs> 1980s right it was probably some really like you know just all sugar <laughs> and uh and yeah and we had a chit chat and i remember coming away from that thinking you know what i'd like to work with that guy that sometime nice? yeah because it was because we had that uh we had that immediate sort of uh, connection to the point where you know i thought to myself not only would i like to work with him sometime but if I ever decide to change teams, I think I'd like him to be my first. <laughs> I might have made that part up. I think so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then the opportunity arose. Some it was years later. It was like three years later was or it so. That long? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was 1988 because because we met in '85. Yes. That's when I started. In I Montreal. have to confess, I don't remember buying you a drink, but I remember one of the things that I learned when I got to Montreal from Winnipeg was it was cutthroat competition. Nobody talked to anybody. Everybody hated the other That's team. the stupidest thing and well, always was, has been. Yeah, and it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of. Yeah. And I thought, well, the hell with that. Yeah. I, you know, I respect this guy. I'm going to buy him a drink, even though there's an umbrella in it. I'm going to buy, <laughs> I'm buy him a drink. And, and uh, but I, I must admit, I don't recall. Yeah, the that, guy that. in the colorful Cosby sweater, could yeah. you send him a drink, please? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so in eighty in nineteen eighty eight, Gord Logan, who was doing the news on your show, yeah. left, and that opening uh, came up. And I had uh, I had up until that time been a news and sports guy. I wasn't a like I wasn't a co host sidekick sort of thing. And and I thought to myself, well, you know what, I could slide right into that news role and show him. I'd probably be a good fit there. And I applied with Ian McLean, who was the uh, program director at the time. And uh, you and Ian came over to my place, and we drank a bunch of scotch and sealed the deal. Yeah. I remember him telling me, um, guess who called me today? And I said, who? And he said, Ted Bird from uh, FM 96. And I said, oh? He said, yeah, he's, he's looking to come over and work for us. And I said, let's get over there. Let's get over there right away. And I don't remember... I, you know, I, I have vague memories of your apartment, which was upstairs. It was an upper duplex. It was an upper duplex. And I remember uh, the living room and sitting at the table. I don't remember what we talk about. I talked about. I do remember we drank. I don't think, were we there that long? I don't think no, we were I don't there think so. that long. An hour or yeah. so, maybe, yeah. And yeah. I came down the stairs, and we got in Ian's car, and I said to him, you've got to put this together. You have to, you have to hire him. And I don't know what it was. I mean, it... it I don't know what it was, but there was something about what happened at at that in your living room yeah. that made me think this would be a great partnership. I don't I even don't remember what, what happened. I just remember I just remember sitting there and drinking scotch, and then within a few days, the deal was done. Yeah. And here's another thing I remember, and you could you could have ended it after our first show because I'll never forget this as long as I live. Have you done or said anything in the course of your life that you think back on it and you go, Oh no, did I really? Oh shit. Did I do that? So we're on the air and I'm pretty sure it was my first show. And, um, uh, Shom had premiered back in the days when radio stations did movie premieres. Shom had premiered big with Tom Hanks. Right the night before and too tall had hosted the premiere and we were on the air and you said, uh, so we premiered, uh, big last night at the Lowe's or the palace or wherever it was. And too tall hosted the premiere because you see it's big and he's too tall. And, and I said, first show I ever worked with you. I said, so if it had been called wide, would you have hosted the premiere? What a shitty thing to say. Like like making a fat joke. Hey, fat Yeah, like right to your face. Hardly knew you at all. Your show, first day, and I was nervous and I was trying too hard to be funny. And I would not have blamed you one bit if you had marched into no. Ian McLean's office after the show that day and said, he's done. But you know what? 
It, uh, I don't re- a, I don't remember you. Oh, saying I do it. because, saying, like I say, that's one of those mortified. things. Oh yeah. no! Yeah. But I, one thing that I do know is that would have what I, you know, because I was able to laugh at myself because I've struggled with my weight all my life, and uh, uh, I think that that would have told me something about your sense of humor and how quick you were on your feet. Yeah, but it was still a shitty thing to say. <laughs> My good friends at Matlau Bonheur are supporters of the Standing By podcast. Ted, have you ever heard of a green sleep mattress? Uh, yes, I have. As a matter of fact, it was the one that I threw up on back in the day, and I couldn't get the green uh, couldn't get the green stains out of it. No, sir, that's a good no. guess. No, sir. Uh, this I'm sure I'm sure Metla Bunner appreciates the plug. Yeah, Sorry. it's a uh, it's a, a mattress that I didn't even know existed. A mattress uh, that is a Canadian product. This locally run company, locally owned company. Uh, that's one of the things that I love about them. They're a family run, family owned business. Um, and uh, when you go into the store, they'll ask you a couple of questions about how you sleep. Do you sleep on your side? Do you sleep on your back? That kind of thing. They're not getting personal. They just want to find the right mattress for you. And they introduced me to a mattress called Green Sleep that I'd never heard of before that really changed the way I sleep and really uh, has delivered some amazing nights for me over the last uh, bunch of years. And they could do the same thing for you. They started as a small, locally owned company with one store. Now there's 17 of them. And you can find a location near you at matlabonner.ca. And uh, by the way, we're on we're on camera somewhere, right? Yes. Aren't we? Yeah. Uh, anyone who who knows you uh, and has known you over the years can see that you've lost a bunch of weight and you've kept it off. Yeah, for the most part, I yeah. uh, I did at one point get really, really, uh, really, really low. I really uh, I lost uh, what my doctor referred to as too much weight. Really? Yeah, I did. I I should you know while we're talking about it, I'll tell this story. I, str- I struggled with my weight all my life and. When I moved to Calgary, there was a time when, and we'll get into this on a later podcast, where I left Shom and uh, I uh, moved to Calgary because I, I got a great offer there. And when I was in Calgary, I um, was busy getting my you know act together and trying to learn how to be a Calgarian and buy cowboy hats and you know learn what Stampede was all about. And I loved my time there. And in my quest to find a doctor, I was lucky I found a doctor, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor uh, had me get on the scale and took my blood pressure and everything else. And he sat me down and he said, uh, see here, you're 50. And I said, yes. And he said, if you want to make 55, he said, you have got to do something. Wow. I weighed 336 pounds. Jesus. And uh, it was the worst shape I've ever been in. And a lot of it came from the stress and the the drinking and all of the things that came with all of the stress I was under leading up to my departure at Shom. Not an excuse, but that's the story. Yeah, yeah. And I went to a, a weight loss clinic, and it's uh, called the Dr. Bernstein's Weight Loss Clinic. They don't open in Quebec because I don't think they... <laughs> Dr. They, Bernstein's, yeah. come on in, fatso. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that was the <laughs> slogan, but... Anyway, um, and I lost 92 pounds, and... Uh, in how long a period of time? In uh, not even not even a year. It's it's a hardcore, uh, you know, calorie restricted. So, so it's a combination of diet and exercise. No, you don't do any exercise. They tell you not to do any exercise, but you eat so little. I mean, I've had bigger meals on airplanes than wow. you're allowed to eat. So restrictive in so many ways. Here's your bean. Yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> well, to give you an idea, I was weighing lettuce. You could only eat so much lettuce. You had to weigh your lettuce. Anyway, I lost the 92 pounds, and around the 90-pound mark, my doctor in Calgary said to me, because I was losing my hair and and falling down the stairs, so (laughs) that (laughs) makes for great You look terrific, (laughs) Terry. I mean, the hair loss and the falling down the stairs, that's probably not so good. You're bald and badly bruised, but you look terrific. (laughs) And uh, he said, that's enough. He said, you're you're in harm's way. Anyway, um, and I've put 40 of that back on, um, but uh, much healthier. Thank you for noticing touch wood. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I got pretty fat for a while. (laughs) Seriously, in the uh, the 2000s, I guess. And in the last five years, I got back into the pool and started swimming again. 
and I've dropped about, I don't know, 30 pounds yeah. or so. Well, I, I think you and I now, at this point in our life, strangely enough, are in better shape than we were. I think so, too. I think by the time we're dead, we're going to look absolutely yeah, fantastic. Gonna yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be like those guys in the coffin where everyone goes, he looks good. He looks really good. He's dead. <laughs> I hate that at funerals. I don't know why they do that. Yeah. Um, do you think that it had anything to do the the sort of rhythm and the success of the show back in 88, 89, 90? Did it have anything to do with Green Avenue and the ridiculous size of that closet-like studio? Possibly. That was a funny little studio, eh? That was... Um, I worked in that building uh, before I came to show them. In 1979, I worked at CKGM for uh, about five months. And Ralph Lockwood was the morning man, and yeah. Robert G. Hall, and Mitch Snaden, and Buster Bodine, and he all was those guys. By radio giants. Yeah, well, it was the it was the it was like the tail end of of uh, top forty AM radio still being right. a, a force. And that room, I believe, that room was the newsroom at that point, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. But I don't think it was as small as it was. I guess they must have. Uh, they must have done some renovations, but yeah, you're right. It was a tiny, it was a tiny little dark room, and that might have had something to do with it. But and you smoked in it. That's the crazy part. You I smoked in like it like a friggin' chimney. Yes, and I think that's another thing that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean you were good about that because yeah. you've been a non-smoker your whole life. I quit about I don't know, it's 21 years ago now, and uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, I haven't had a drink in over 24 years, and you could sit in front of me on a hot day with a cold beer or with a glass of chilled white wine with that one droplet running down the side of the glass. Wouldn't bother me one bit. Wow. But you light a smoke. Really? And I smell that that really? freshly lit tobacco. Wow. Oh, boy. Really? Eh? Yeah, I could fall off that wagon real wow. easy. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Wow. But anyway, it was good of you to let me smoke in the studio <laughs> because uh, it just... <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, it was just, I was like, I was, it was, it was for, and smokers know this, it's a comfort thing, right. you know, and it's, and it's a habitual thing as a smoker. I can remember pour a coffee, light a smoke. Right. Get on the phone, light a smoke. Smokers will understand. Get in the saying. car, light a smoke. Right. Sit down in front of the microphone to read the news, light a smoke. And and you always uh, let me smoke. You never said, hey, hey you can't no. smoke in my studio. And no. uh, yeah, Christ, if you get emphysema, that's on me, I guess. <laughs> Although I think, like I say, it's, yeah, it's been, I haven't had a cigarette in, in uh, I, it was New Year's Eve 1990-something. You know how I quit finally? Why? I because uh, I tried everything. Remember the patch? Remember when I tried I the patch? Yeah. And remember Life yeah. Sign? Yeah. <laughs> there was this little, this little like computer thing, yeah. and and it would tell you when you could have a cigarette. Yeah. Yeah. Like you would program it, and then it would tell you when you could smoke it. It was the the point was it would wean you off of the tobacco. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how far I threw that thing. Well, I was going to say. I remember your efforts to quit smoking a couple of times. Yeah. And after you'd leave the studio, I'd say to Patty, I'm going to buy him a fucking <laughs> cigarette soon because, he's, because it, it's a tough thing to do. And, it's and the hard, I think yeah, it's the hardest habit. They you, say it's harder than be, getting off heroin. You became fairly irritable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they say that nicotine is more addictive than they, whoever yeah. they are. Yeah. But I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard it, so it must be true. Yeah, it must yeah. be. You saw it on yeah. the internet. So I finally went to my doctor, Dr. Benjamin in Cote St. Luke, who's still my doctor today yeah. after all these years. And uh, I told him, I want to quit smoking. What do you suggest? And he gave me a prescription for a pill called Zyban which was used as a stop smoking aid. Mm -hmm. It's also Wellbutrin by another name. Ooh. And Wellbutrin is an antidepressant. So I took the Zyban. Uh, I managed to quit smoking. And my wife at the time said to me, I want you to keep taking those. I know you don't smoke anymore, but I want you to keep taking those pills. I like you better when you're on those pills. Really? Yeah. Wow. So so apparently I was also, uh, I was depressed at the Did time. Did you get yeah. any of the side effects that they list on TV? Vomit, diarrhea. No, 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 no. I guess it, no. They seem to. I guess according I to her, they they uh, they did me good. I don't recall your shit in your pants. No, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, well, stand by. Yeah, <laughs> the day is young. <laughs> 
I think there is uh, something to be said for the, uh, the uh, you know, when you work in the radio game, if you're doing something creative, there's something to be said for your surroundings and the challenge in those surroundings. And I think it was um, the surroundings of the Shom studio being as Spartan as it was and as small as it was, um, made for a bit of a rock and roll vibe. Yep. And it didn't feel like we were doing anything serious, and we weren't. I mean, we're on the radio and trying to generate revenue for owners, but they, there was just there was just something about that small studio on Green Avenue. When I'm walking down Green Avenue in Westmount, I, I look up at that door and I close my eyes, not when I'm driving. Um, I, I close my eyes and, and I, 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 this flood of memories comes back to me from you know, all the different artists that we uh, interviewed there. And <clears throat> I don't know if I can properly describe this, but the studio was so tiny that when you push the door open, if there was somebody behind the door... They had to stay behind the door while the door was open. If this, am I describing this properly? Yeah. You know, you push the door open. And yeah, they were trapped. Yeah, it would. Open. There was nowhere to go. Yeah, and if you were near the door, you had to go into the corner and stay behind the door. And one day, a good friend of ours was, uh, I think he was working at the radio station at the time, and he was uh, in the in the studio and. Let's just say that the studio was small enough that it wasn't it wasn't fart friendly. I know exactly. You know what I was going to say. Tell the Justine Bateman story, well, and that's, that's exactly where you're going, that's isn't exactly it? Exactly where I'm going. This is such a great story. And um, it, and he, you know, people would come into the studio to visit every morning uh, after around quarter to nine, ten to nine. We were just playing requests and having a good time, and your newscasts were done. And, and people, you know, as, as it is still, as it was at Shom eight months ago, people would come and see me during the request hour or during the rock ride. Anyway, on this particular day, Blair was standing in the studio, and I guess he had been out the night before. And um, my guess is he probably went out for a really good Mexican dinner and then went <laughs> drinking. <laughs> Because educated guess. Right. That that just be an educated yeah. guess. Because he 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 farted and uh, listen, I'm not one flies to talk. fell off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, when something is so bad you, you momentarily think you're gonna pass out. Yeah. And maybe two seconds after that uh rose hit the air, the door creaked open. And it went, as it did. And he ducked, you know, he had to move so the door could open. So he was behind the door. And in walked Justine Bateman. Who at the time was a big TV star. Big TV star. Yeah. And, and we weren't expecting her. And I looked up with, you know, the shirt over my nose. And I looked up. And she looked in. And she went, <laughs> <laughs> And immediately left the oh, studio. No. And, I thought, and that was it? That was the extent of her visit? Again. Really? She never came oh, back. Oh, I didn't realize that. No, she never oh, came Christ. back. Oh, Christ. And I thought, that girl thinks that was me. And that <laughs> bastard's behind the door. <laughs> and Justine Bateman thinks that I'm not well. And, and, and she left and she never came back. And probably to this day, anytime someone mentions Montreal to her, she probably tells that it's Montreal. Jesus, I got a story about Montreal. I'm never going back there. I've never smelled anything so bad. I think, you know, Justine Bateman notwithstanding, I, I, I think that was a little bit part of the charm. The and, smell of Blair's fart? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the size of the studio. Yes. Like, can't laugh like I used to without joking. Yeah, really, eh? Yeah. Well, that whole building was, uh, it's chock full of memories. And it was, it was a legendary building. And it was, it was not even the most, the most legendary no. studio on Green Avenue. And I don't think either you or I ever got to work in that old. No, in the old mansion. The old mansion. No, I yeah. missed it by a month. I Really? Yeah, I missed it by a month. I got hired in uh, late October of 1984 and uh they moved they had a 
they had to chase the ghost out of their party in October of 84 and moved everything over. And when I arrived in November, the uh, the move was just fresh. I just missed it. And I remember it because I was in the record business for a little while and used to have to pay uh, visits on behalf of the bands I was working for to that. Old oh, band. so you had been in the building. I had been in okay, the building, I never but was. I, never worked in I was it. never yeah, in the building. It was, it was really quite spectacular. Yeah. Well, you hear stories about, you know, the the gigantic rock stars right. who would stroll down Green Avenue and go into that building and talk to Too Tall or Doug Pringle or whoever, like David Bowie and uh, just yeah, the, like the huge list, names. The list of legends, and we'll get to some of these over the course of the. Uh, uh, the first couple of podcasts. You better stay up close on that microphone or yes. Poseidon's going to give you shit again. I know, I'm going to get in trouble now. <laughs> it's the three-finger rule. Three-finger rule? Yes. Not not spread out, though. Stuck. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, he's going to have one <laughs> finger for you yeah. probably, <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> well, Ted, I'm sure it won't surprise too many people that the folks at the Mersons have decided to support the podcast and just in time... For their tire sale. Now, listen, I know I'm on a podcast. I know you may be listening to this next year. But in case you've downloaded the podcast just in time for the tire sale, you've got to hear this. It's the fourth annual tire blowout sale at Merson on St. Jacques, just west of Cavendish. Saturday, September 25th, Merson and Yokohama team up again to offer you terrific deals on tires. Take advantage of an exclusive sale with up to $70 in rebates, including free tire installation and balancing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> the first 50 customers get a $50 gift card to spend at Merson throughout the year. Get down there September 25th. If it's not September 25th or if it's past September 25th, get thee to a time machine, go back in time and take <laughs> advantage of these fabulous savings. Find out all about it. And uh, even if you missed the tire sale, don't miss their amazing service and long time honesty. It's the way they've built the business. It's been there for over 50 years. 487 5545 or mercenauto.com. This is the point of the program uh, where we uh, have got to uh, give uh, thanks to our very good friends. Now, let me see. I've Here we go. Practicing. Yeah, okay. Let's hear it. Jaguar. Land Rover Laval. Nice. Thank very, very nice. Much. Because I was getting help from my wife. Jess was getting mad at me because I was saying Jaguar. For as long as I've known you, yes. you've called them Jaguar. Right. J-A-G-W-I-R-E. That's not it. Jaguar Land Rover Laval. And specifically, a big thank you to the dealership in Laval. It's a family-run family-owned dealership, and we've known the family for a very long time. Nino and Renato DiCubellis, we've known them for uh, at least 20, closer to 25, it is 25 years, 25 years or more, and uh, they uh, they have been running that dealership up there for in Laval for almost that long, and... I'll tell you a story. This is the kind of guys that Nino and Renato are. When I left Shome in 2010 and uh, got a job a few months later at K103 in Ganawage, which for those who don't know is a, a Mohawk native reserve on the south shore of Montreal. And I reached out <coughs> to a number of people and business associates who I had known uh, during my time at Shome and said, listen, I'm I'm moving over to uh, moving over to Ganawage. I'm going to work at the uh, at the native station, and they're having a news conference to make the announcement. And then I'd like it if uh, you could come. You know, you're invited to come. And I don't remember who all showed up. Not a lot did because I think it was a lot of uh, well, you know, he's, he's going to the native station over in Ganawage. He's uh, the guy's done. He's finished. You know, well, why would we go over there? You know who showed up? Nino and Renato. That's who. Oh. And they showed up. Uh, not because they saw a business opportunity. They showed up out of friendship and to show their support for me. That's the kind of people that they are. One of the things that, that we loved about them uh, for all of these years is it's a family that treats their customers like family. And their staff yeah, as well. That's right. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, they treat you like family. They got big trust uh, for you. <laughs> they gave you a brand new Defender to drop. That's right. I'm squiring Terry about town <laughs> in the 2021 Motor Trend SUV of the year, I'll have you know. 
the Land Rover Defender. Boy, cars have come along. Oh, way, eh? my goodness. I drive a 10-year-old car, and <laughs> yeah. I got in that Defender, and I thought, I don't have a pilot's license. What are they letting me drive this thing you for? You like to see Ted and I trying to get the <laughs> phone connected to this <laughs> beautiful, beautiful vehicle. Oh, yeah, God. And get, anyway, and by the way, when you're there... Uh, if you like to dream, have a look at the McLarens on the other Holy side. Holy smokes. Of the, uh, yeah, they also uh, have uh, the Montreal yeah. McLaren yeah. dealership. I believe it's the only McLaren dealership east of Toronto, right. if I'm not mistaken. And uh, those are supercars. A big, big thank you to our friends at Jaguar Land Rover Laval. You're almost there. I still hear a little, a bit, of a little wire, bit of the wire. A tiny bit, yeah. Jaguar. yeah. Well, that's it's like me when I say any word with R in it. I still have my maritime hard R's. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's get the car, get down to the bar. It's not too far. <laughs> big, big thank you to them. All right. It's uh, time to uh, continue talking about us. Are you bored of talking about us yet? Standing by. <laughs> I guess this is a good place to uh, talk about why we called it Standing By, the uh, Terry and Ted podcast. That was Jess's idea, wasn't yeah, it? it was my wife's idea. Yeah. My wife is... My She's wife, pretty smart. She knows you better than you know yeah, you. Yeah, she really yeah. does. I said to the guys here in the building when we were today, we were talking about girlfriends and wives, and I said, uh, they said, are you married? And I said, yeah, I'm married, and if I wasn't married, I'd be dead, God love her. Well, um, she, you waited a long time. I did. Yeah, and the, uh, and the exactly right the right yeah. woman came along for you. Yeah, and uh, Jess uh, Jess is uh, has been a, a huge help, really kind of a co-producer of the podcast yep. and uh, the behind-the-scenes stuff. Anyway, um, she came up with the idea because... Standing by. <laughs> That's what we used to do. Every time there was a problem, because it, it's, a, it's a thing in the business... You know, if you've ever hung around, you know, people in television or radio, they're they're often waiting for things, and there's always somebody around yelling, "Stand by!" Yeah, yeah. And well, especially just before you go on the air, right? Yeah. And Stand we by. Used, we used to say, uh, you know, when if Ted and I were on a TV set, we used to make fun. Once in a while, we'd be on a television set about to be interviewed, and TV people, especially in the '80s and '90s, had such. You know, especially the technical people, they were they were wired pretty tight. Yeah, you know, they wanted you there five hours early. Uh, you know, if you were appearing on, you know, remember we used to appear on some of those those local talk shows that yeah, were on television. Yeah, we were on with Leslie Roberts right. one time, right. and yeah, and they they want you there like two hours in advance. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. and we used to like to poke fun at them. Because when the guys on the set would would yell "Stand by," and Ted standing I, by, and <laughs> I would lean forward and go "Standing by," and they would get so mad. And, and whenever there was a, an issue, if we had technical problems during the program, which for during many, our show, yeah, yeah, for many many years, I I was the technical producer of the show. And when there when there was you know problems operating problems, Ted would always yell, <laughs> "Stand by, <laughs> standing by." Well, there was lots of dead air. Anyway. But to Jeff or Jess, and I was yeah. speaking to her yesterday. The ultimate standing by for her was yeah. the time when we did have a producer, Ryan Wood. Yes, Ryan got sick and had to go home, mm -hmm. and this was in uh, the early. 2000 early 2000 aughts or whatever you call the right. the zero years and and it had all gone computerized when you used to run the board it was still turntables and carts yeah, all analog and and but by now it was all computerized ryan got sick like out of the blue and real sick and had yeah. to leave he had to go home and so terry had to run the board and had no friggin' idea what he was doing and uh and I, there were a few standing yeah. by. She's just like, okay, I'm going to try to play the commercial now. You ready? <laughs> standing by. Okay. Oh, shit. That's not it. Okay. How about if I play a song? You're playing two songs. <laughs> standing by. <laughs> there is, uh, hopefully there'll be a way to, to play some of these over the course of the next episodes. I think I'd like to do an episode where we play some of the... Uh, some of the, the bloopers? Yeah, some of the highlights and, and, sort and of clips. The best of. And, uh, and we talk about what went on behind them. While I'm thinking of it, let me tell one TV story. You were talking about how uptight some of the uh, some of the the texts, the yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah, well, they were under people. a lot of pressure. I don't, you know, yeah. I'm not putting them down. I'm just but, saying they were wound pretty tight. But the irony is quite often that the guy or gal on camera was not wound up tight, and if something screwed up, they were fine. And I told Terry this story earlier today. This is one of my favorite TV stories of all time. Tom Whalen, who is my partner on the morning show at Light 106.7 in Hudson, 
uh, tells a great story about when he was a behind the scenes guy on the uh, on the floor crew at uh, the old Pulse News. CFCF TV and Brian Britt was doing the news one day. I don't know if it was an afternoon or an evening newscast. And right out of the gate, it was just one fuck up after the next. Like he would introduce a report and they would play the wrong report. And they would come back to him and they would cue him to look at this camera, but it was this camera that was on. So you'd see like a profile shot of him and he'd have to turn around and look into that camera so so just one shit show after the next and finally at you know 10 12 minutes in they go to commercial and uh, as soon as they're off the air brian Britt is sitting there and if you knew brian Britt, he had this great deadpan expression and he's sitting there with his hands folded like this <laughs> and he turns around to tom and he goes well i thought that went very well don't you tom <laughs> That's a pro, boy, let me tell you. How many people would be well, throwing stuff well, around yeah. and playing the prima donna? <laughs> this, and- this is a, a good place to uh, to tell the story, and, and you'll tell it better than I do, of the uh, uh, <laughs> the morning um, you didn't you had a cart that hadn't uh, a cart. Carts were where they were like eight tracks. Eight track tapes, and yeah. On those eight track tapes were recordings of reporters and recordings of, you know, somebody go to interview the mayor, they'd come back and they would put the the clip of what they wanted to use in their news story on this cartridge that went in the machine. And you had to make sure that the cartridges were queued up. and To the beginning of the, the beginning report or the, the clip, report. yeah. And there was this one morning you read the story <laughs> and I don't, I can't, do you remember the name of the reporter? Mm-hmm. Okay, you, you tell the story because the, this was something similar that happened. So I had obviously, I had lo- not let the cart loop all the way through and queue up to the beginning. So I went on and I, I forget what the story was. It was something out of Quebec City and the Quebec government today, blah, 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 blah. Peter Ray reports from Quebec City and Terry presses the cart and it goes, Peter Ray, Quebec City. <laughs> And that was it. And I said, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Quite the report there. <laughs> In-depth journalism. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that wasn't something that we were, were known for, but um, that was something you took very seriously. When you did the news, you put together a very, very good, credible newscast, and you took a lot of pride in that. Well, thanks. Yeah, well, you had to. I yeah. mean, you know, it's not something you can, uh, well, yeah. I suppose you can. You can screw around and... and be loosey goosey and light with the news, or make up the news. Is the well, most well, that's yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Um, but there's not a lot of credibility in no, that. So, no. and and also, I learned from uh, you know, I learned at the at the knees of old school, yeah. uh, radio news yeah. veterans. You you learned at the uh, at the feet of uh, throw stuff guys. Yeah, well, yeah. my the, the the guy who I learned the most from uh, in terms of news and broadcasting in general. Uh, in many ways, was a guy named Robert Holliday, who's still alive today. He's got to be 80 years old if he's a day. He was the news director at CFTR in Toronto. And I worked there when I was, I got a job there when I was 20. And I, there's no way I should have been there. I just got lucky and got the job. And he uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. And you never made the same mistake twice with Holliday right. because uh, he'd blow your head right off. Right. Yeah. And he he even looked like Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> he had the same mustache and everything. Well, he would have been proud of your work, except uh, the uh, the morning he came in with no news. That was good. Yeah, you one came, morning I came, came in, in and, and I, <laughs> I I don't know what I did, uh, how I came in with no news. I don't know. Um, I had the weather. It was a headline package, yeah. and I had the weather forecast on top. I used to have two sheets: the weather forecast, and it was headline package, just one one sheet underneath with the news on it. And I picked up the wrong paper, <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that because I had the weather forecast on top. So I, I went wish in. We and, had the tape yeah, of it because really, it eh? was a lot of. <laughs> it was during the Oka crisis. <laughs> yeah. It was during the Oka crisis. So uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was bad. So I go in and I said, the weather, you know, mainly sunny today and a high of 23. And then I... There's a long pause. Yeah. 
I put the weather down and I looked down and I go, holy Jesus, I didn't bring in the news. <laughs> I had one story but about... you didn't say that. No, 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 no. It was a long pause because uh, yeah. you were looking at a story about a shark in Australia. Something like you? that, yeah. Just, it was a kicker story. Yeah. You know, it was it was just a light, fluffy, throwaway story. So I thought, what am I going to do? Shit, there's the newspaper. I'll just take the newspaper and get the news, read the news out of that. And so you hear this rattling of the newspaper because I'm shaking, right? Because I'm so... I'm shitting my pants. I'm like, what am I going to do? And I'm... Me, Okay, <laughs> crisis continues. <laughs> and I had my back to you, and I thought, "What the hell's going on?" Going on, and I looked over, and you were, you were trying to read the news from the newspaper, and that, that story says something about how even at show we took it seriously. The news, the news was, the news was supposed to be. It was a, a uh, it was a, f- a f- four minutes of where you didn't you yeah didn't you, screw you around. don't goof around yeah, yeah it yeah. was serious yeah that was if that was nineteen ninety yeah I'd been in the business for twelve years I should have that, that was actually a, a disgraceful performance well, I should have been better than that <laughs> no I I panicked I, I panicked yeah but I I think you panicked because of your respect for the news and and what you were supposed to be doing it wasn't you know well it, you know it, what what i should have done is i should and i would have done this a few years later yeah. going, hey guess what i didn't bring the news in yeah, i forgot play a, the yeah, i forgot the news play a commercial i'll be right back <laughs> well i think this would be a good spot to uh, wrap up this uh, episode ted you this, want to do that this is uh this has been kind of fun uh, for the uh, first episode um, you want to I, do it nine or ten more times? I think so. Okay. Um, I uh, we we should talk about some of the things that we uh, we have in mind. I think we we are in episodes coming up. Uh, we are going to uh, get some clips from our uh, friend Mark Stafford. Yep. And uh, look back at some of the crazy things that went on. Uh, a few people have asked if we would talk about some of the, the stars that we've met, mm-hmm. uh, mostly music stars, because you know Poseidon. Uh, Poseidon we've met Poseidon. One. We're going to talk to Poseidon in, in one of the episodes. Um, uh, but our our interactions with you know Bon Jovi and Krista Berg and Dennis DeYoung and Roger Hodgson and Melissa Etheridge and you know people that we have become fond of and friends with uh, over the years. Um, so we'll do that, and uh, uh, basically whatever pops into our mind, which is, I think, the joy of the podcast. Yeah, we're going to try not to be two old guys telling stories uh, about back in the day. My yeah. kids tell me that I have ten stories, and I tell them on a loop. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to try to break out of that and be and be contemporary yeah, as well. But I think you know we have a we have a long and uh, sordid history, and I think do. there are there are stories that haven't been told that yeah. need to be told, and yes. I think this is the platform for telling. Yeah, them. there's uh, the story of us leaving showman going to the mix Mm -hmm. there's the story of us going to cjad there's the story of the time that we ate way too much hash in amsterdam yes there's the story of when howard stern came to town that's right and we had to uh, compete with him and uh we ended up in what was that magazine in ottawa frank frank magazine yeah and i was the uh, you were an no, over no. overpaid mouthpiece, and yes. I was your your B grade Ed McMahon sidekick. <laughs> so there's lots to tell on the uh, podcast called Standing By with Terry and Ted. Standing By the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval because you're probably going to move up north at some point anyway. So you might as well drive a Land Rover and fit in.